Hello, everybody. Welcome into a Tuesday edition of the Computer America Show. We've got a great program planned for you tonight. Of course, in hour two, we're going to have computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. And in hour one, um, I mentioned we're going to start doing this. Uh, we're going to start inviting uh, a lot more. Um, oh, how should I say it? Uh, two minutes until showtime. From the academic world onto our program. Uh, and uh, we have. I guess we're starting off with a bang with this. Uh, MIT uh, is here. Actually, we're going to have the professor, uh, Adam uh, Chapala, who is the assistant professor of computer science. And we're going to be talking about something called Urweb. And if you don't know what that is, well, it's a programming language uh, that helps you design websites. And we're going to be talking about that uh, here on the first hour of the show. Again, congratulations to all of our contest winners from last night. Uh, Logitech, has, Logitech has been informed, and your prizes should be on their way mo uh, shortly. And, of course, don't forget to check out our homepage at ComputerAmerica.com for all the things that go on here on the program. We're here Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. to midnight in our 24th year on the air, Computer America. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show. We'll be starting in about a minute. One minute until showtime. As she says. <laughs> so stand by. Thirty seconds. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And you sound normal tonight, Ben. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the annoying hum was actually a, uh, a frog in my throat. Yeah, so uh, we, we got that out, threw that away, and uh, just kept the, uh, the shrill, annoying voice, which yeah. uh, is working out well for everyone. Actually, it was a believe it or not, it was a power strip. We have we had a power strip from the day of the flood. I don't know if they make power strips like that anymore. And evidently, it had a trans. Oh, it, 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 let's say it was a Radio Shack special. Yeah, it, uh, it actually had a transformer in there, and and <laughs> and I'm not talking about the kind that you know changed to a little cute robot. Uh, but there was a there's a was a transformer in there. It was causing the worst buzz and hum uh, that you could imagine. And we had never used it before, and guess what? No one will ever use it again because it's in the trash as we speak. Uh, um, so, uh, but you know, uh, anyway, you sound you sound good, you sound clear, and uh, and as I said, uh, we have a terrific show uh, planned for you uh, in the second hour. Coming up, we have computer and technology news. Of course, that's always brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. And uh, and uh, in this first hour, uh, you know, it's interesting because last night. We had Squarespace on. Uh, Squarespace is a website that is designed to make websites, and without any really any programming language uh, knowledge, you don't have to be a programmer to use it. It's very easy. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know if you watched the Super Bowl. They had an ad there. You know, they had Jeff Bridges designing his website. You know, obviously Jeff Bridges is not a programmer, uh, but everyday people can create fairly sophisticated websites. But you know. 
um, there is more to that uh, than uh, because if you are a programmer, then you probably don't need something like that. And uh, our guest tonight here is to talk about website programming. And uh, he is from something called the Computer Science and Artificial Laboratory known as CSAIL. And it is the largest research laboratory at MIT and one of the world's most important centers of information technology research. Uh, CSAIL and its members have played a key role in the computer revolution. Uh, the lab's researchers have been key movers in developments like time sharing, massively parallel computers, public key encryption, uh, the mass commercialization of robots, and much of the technology underlying the ARPANET, the Internet, and the World Wide Web. Now, here with us this hour is Assistant Professor of Computer Science, Professor Adam Chapala. Adam, welcome into Computer America. How are you, sir? Hi, thanks, Craig. I'm doing great. So, uh, whoa, 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 wait. See sale for the distribution of robots. So we blame you for the Terminators. We blame you guys for the downfall of humanity, huh? <laughs> when when that downfall comes, I will apologize. <laughs> we know who to go to now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, by the way, I, I was so excited that I've been a little remiss in my job as a, as a host of the show. So let me just say, if you ha have a question or comment about anything you're hearing this hour, we certainly would like to hear from you. Let me give you the phone number to call, which is 347-884-8881. That's 347-884-8881. I'll get you on and get you through. Email is live, L-I-V-E, at computeramerica.com. We have that set up if you don't want to go on the air, but you have a question for our guest. That's a good way to get it in. You can also uh, join us in our live interactive uh, chat room from our homepage at computeramerica.com. You'll see Interact with the Show a chat and live video button, because click it. On the left-hand side there, you'll see our entry form for the chat room. It's an IRC chat room. Just put in a username. That's the name you'll be known by when you go in there. I click the connect button, and you're, you're in. It's just that simple. Uh, on the right-hand side of that same page is our live Computer America video streaming page. That's right. Not only can you listen to the Computer America show, because we are primarily a radio broadcast, but you can also watch it. You can actually see everything that's going on. You can see myself. You can see Ben. Sometimes you can see the guests or a demonstration. So we welcome you uh, in, uh, to join us in our live Computer America video streaming page. Uh, that's all available at our website at ComputerAmerica.com. So, Adam, let's talk about... Uh, ben just uh, blamed you for... <laughs> for uh, Not you specifically. Unfortunately, you are the mascot right now of CSL, but your department, I guess. Yeah. So t t tell us a little bit about uh, 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 your department and, and the CSAIL and, and what it is that you do uh, I I there, uh, Adam. Sure. So uh, CSAIL is one of the interdis well, interdepartmental laboratories at MIT. So we have several uh, different departments represented in the lab in the classic academic disciplines like computer science and electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And CSAIL is an organization of, of researchers doing work in computer science and artificial intelligence, which includes uh, potentially the robots that are going to take over the world, but also includes things like what I work on, which is building better tools for programmers to make them more effective in creating higher quality software. And many of my colleagues work on issues in hardware and uh, things like machine learning to understand data sets better and, and a, a variety of different topics like that. Okay. Now, uh, wait. So you you are creating tools so others can use the tools that you create easy. Like, why why is something like that necessary when you could just create a programming language and say, figure it out, guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's necessary because human brains aren't perfect, and by doing a little upfront investment in creating better tools, we can enable fallible programmers to do a better job delivering working software in a smaller amount of time at a lower cost. All so right. that's, that's what that's what Urweb is, is meant to facilitate, giving the programmers the tools they need to build the stuff they want, uh, ideally, if, if they have the right training, with lower cost than with competing tools. So do you have to be uh, you have to be enrolled in MIT to understand uh, Urweb, the Urweb programming language, uh, programming language uh, or <laughs> I mean, how complex is this? Well, the the language is really aimed at people who 
enjoy something called functional programming, which is a style of programming that's becoming more popular all the time. It's embodied in maybe some of the most highly visible languages are, for example, Scala, which is a, a language that runs in the Java ecosystem, but also brings in ideas from functional programming. And functional programming is really all about making programming more like algebra instead of making it like writing a recipe or a sequence of steps that explains what to do to change the state of the computer. Instead, you write something closer to mathematical formulas, which expresses the behavior that you're looking for. And then instead of running the formula by executing a sequence of steps, you're sort of simplifying it algebraically until it gets to the right answer. And this style of programming can make certain programming tasks easier to understand because the, the big challenges of, of programming tend to be even understanding your own code a week after you wrote it. And the problem is even worse if you're working with a team of programmers. So anything that makes the analysis of programs simpler is potentially a big win. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. My degree is in computer science and engineering, so I mean, I I I went through all the programming classes, and uh, I actually uh, really enjoyed programming. Uh, you know, I think you have to have a a knack for it. You know, but yeah, filling out those punch cards is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were a little more advanced than that, but but the but the, but the point is, uh, obviously, things have come a long way because languages I was learning was Fortran and COBOL and. And uh, and uh, you know assembly language. I mean you know so uh, and with a, with a little you know Pascal and and uh, but it, it, obviously this is uh, you're in a whole different level now. I mean languages have come along. Uh, the languages that I mentioned, I don't know if they're still even used today. I assume they are. But uh, I think all those languages are are still used. Maybe among the ones you listed, Fortran is is probably the, the most widely used. It's still the standard language. I think of scientific computing to do large-scale yeah. simulations of physics and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, form, formula translation is where it, come, that where it comes from, and that's what it is. So the more, the more math you learned, the, the obviously the more things you could do. It, it really became quite clear to me why it was necessary to know math, because the more math you could do, the, 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 more, the more you could get that translated into actual physical uh, you know, uh, react, uh, response from the computer. It was for me. It was very eye-opening too, because I said, "Why am I learning all this stuff? And you know, what's the purpose of it?" And then, then started getting into programming. I went, "Oh, oh, I see what's going on here." So, so uh, <laughs> now it, uh, I assume. But it, but the the thing you were mentioning about your co uh, you know your coding technique, it seemed you know you were comparing it to math and you you know and writing formulas. That's very logical. And even though programming, I guess to an extent, should be logical, what we, you know, and and where Craig has his degree in computer science, I am pursuing my degree in computer science. So, uh, you know, and what I'm finding with a lot of programming languages nowadays is that they're very intuitive, or at least they're trying to make them more intuitive. And sometimes intuitive and logical can go, you know, two separate ways. I think that's a fair criticism. I like to think that the intuitive languages make it easy to do relatively simple things or easy to do more complex things so that you get your program almost right. If you want to scale up the complexity or you want things to, you want to follow a higher standard of uh, correctness or reliability, then it pays off to learn these less intuitive techniques the same way that engineers in more traditional disciplines have to learn mathematical foundations so that the bridges don't found, fall down. Yeah. The same sort of thing pays off in programming, and I, I hope that that perspective becomes more mainstream over time. Yeah, uh, I, I understand. Now, again, uh, and we're going get, to get, get into the, more into this Urweb programming language. Um, um, I had not heard of it though. So, is is it is it uh, is it the, is it an obscure language, or is it something that's just you know coming around? It's something new. I mean, uh, what's what? Can you get a little background behind Urweb? Sure. Uh, I think obscure is a, a fair description. Mm -hmm. I started working on it when I was a graduate student in, I think it was around 2006, mm -hmm. and uh, open source versions have been available online since about that time. Mm -hmm. The first commercial application built with Urweb, I think that came out um, maybe around 2013. So it's been a, a, a long journey to this point, and uh, the basic approach from my perspective has been try to design the language I'd like to use and uh, keep waiting for, for 
people to find it online and experiment with it and hopefully figure out that they like it. So, so UrWeb falls into this, this category of functional programming languages, which has a, a large, you could say, fan club online. And a few people have run across the language and, and found it pleasant to use. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see more of that go on over time. Well, you know, if you walk into Barnes and Noble and you go to the computer science, you'll see books on C++. You'll see countless books on, uh, you know, HTML and everything. Uh, would I find a book on UrWeb anywhere in there? Is it, uh, or do, are the uh, books out there for it? Uh, I'd be very surprised if you did. I'm not aware of any books written about UrWeb. Yeah, I, because I, I, I mean, I, my last 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 recollection was not seeing this anywhere. So. Uh, uh, but yet it's being now it's being offered uh, as a course at MIT. Is that what you're you're are you teaching this there? Oh, I've I've taught a few lectures about it in in a few courses, but mostly this is an an open source tool that I like to think of as a secret weapon waiting to be wielded by more people. <laughs> And if a few people have wielded it already. There's the this first commercial web application built with UrWeb that I mentioned is called Baz Quox Reader, named by a non-native English speaker who at least mildly regrets the choice of name. But he has thousands of paying customers using this application built using UrWeb. And I, I I guess I'll probably have a chance to say a little later what I think is the pitch for the advantage to the the web application developer of choosing our web and it seems like a few people have been convinced so far and there are a few serious applications online using it. Alright, now you did say one thing that, oh I'm sorry. I was, about to, uh, no, I was about to say, uh, Craig sounded like he was just about to bring it up. You said Java or at least it ran in uh, some, some form of Java and Craig oh and let's be honest here, most, most of us on the show have an instant uh, very visceral reaction to Java in any sort. All right. Well, in that case, I'm happy to clarify that I said Scala, the programming language, was, was related to oh, Java. Okay. There's no connection with UrWeb. Oh, okay. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Java has just messed up more things and applications that I can think of. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, especially with HTML5, you know, they can do every they can do everything that Flash and everything that uh, Java does with HTML5. Really, has the potential. They don't even need them anymore. Why do they still have them around? I don't know. But uh, okay. Uh, I definitely agree that uh, Java in the the web browser is not on an upward trajectory of popularity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, you, uh, now I, I understand that UrWeb is a statistically typed functional programming language. What does uh, that, that mean? That that's actually statically typed. Statically. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've heard the idea of statistically typed. Sounds <laughs> like a good research direction. <laughs> statically typed. Yes. What does that mean? So. Uh, an example of the, the opposite, a dynamically typed language, is Python or PHP, where you have a you're, you can have a variable in your program that at certain times might hold a number and at other times might hold a, a string of text or a variety of other kinds of objects. Right. And if you compare that with a language like Java or C++, then every variable has what's called a static type. It's basically uh, some, some annotation on that variable that guarantees that every value that the variable takes on will belong to a particular type. So you might have some variable labeled as an integer, and then you know that right. any value that ever shows up in there is an integer. Exactly. Or it could be a string, a variable, and it would, and it would be contain letters, you know, for whatever you wanted to say. Right. And mm -hmm. this kind of feature in programming languages has a, a few classic advantages. One of them is helping catch mistakes in the program before you even run it. Mm -hmm. Because maybe you would have been surprised if you wound up with some text in this thing you thought was an integer. <laughs> Another classic advantage is facilitating efficient execution of programs by, say, allocating less storage for a value because you know exactly what it is. You don't need extra information associated with it. And I'd say the, the third and, and maybe sometimes the most important advantage is that static types provide a kind of machine check documentation about your program. The programming language implementation makes sure there's always going to be an integer in this position and that's documentation for the programmer to help understand how this program might behave and when you come back to your code after a year without looking at it this can be very helpful to get back on top of things and it's also useful for understanding how to use someone else's code like in a library but what what wouldn't wouldn't just uh, you know comments in, in the code itself you know i mean uh, wouldn't that uh, pretty much do the same thing you have comment fields just put it in well 
the thing about comments is they, they classically get out of date. They, they become completely unrelated to the actual code that's running because there's no program that's checking the relationship between the comments and the code. And static oh. type systems provide this kind of uh, machine-checked comments, which is a big step forward for a large project where it can be hard oh. to keep, keep the comments in sync. Okay. Well, that's nice. So, so, so actually, the comments are being issued by the programming language itself based upon the logic of the program which is, uh, um, I don't think I've ever seen or heard anything quite like that before. That is, that is very interesting. Um, the, uh, so, okay, so, the, um, um, so, so let's continue on. So in other words, what would you say are some of the advantages uh, to choosing UrWeb over other languages for web development, like some of them I mentioned, like HTML5, which is certainly right now I think is the is the wonder child of uh, web design for programming languages. Yeah, so pretty much everyone building web applications is using HTML because that's what the browsers are speaking. Then there are these other languages that you you use on top of HTML, like PHP or right. Or Ruby with a framework like Ruby on Rails, Python mm -hmm. with a framework like Django. Mm -hmm. Or web is really in the same category as those those last three. Okay. I got it. Okay. It's something you use to build a web application, sort of uh, the dynamic functionality we expect of a, a Gmail or a Facebook or something like that, rather than just a page that is a, a document that sits there while you look at it. Now, uh, are the ones you just mentioned, Facebook, and the, 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 uh, what else will you mention? Are they using UrWeb? Because obviously, the, the the Facebook pages are extremely dynamic. I mean, they're uh, when you use them. No, no, none of those big name sites are, are using UrWeb now, as far as I know. But uh, UrWeb is designed to support that kind of functionality. Okay. Now, so where where in a like where would UrWeb Really outshine, you know, some of the other uh, development codes. Like when you love, you mentioned that it's uh, it's more stable when it gets more complex, which is obviously like, would would you see better results using uh, your pro uh, this programming language with complex things like that, or with just anything you build is eventually going to you know outshine the others? So I usually try to summarize my claims about the advantages of UrWeb in three dimensions. One of them is improved programmer productivity. Features like the static type system make it easier for, for programmers to write code that uh, is missing certain kinds of bugs as soon as it's deployed into the field and makes it easier to understand and evolve your code over time. The second I, category that I like to... Oh, do you want I to... Stop, I just want to stop you. I just want to stop okay. you there. Uh, am I getting from this? Is, is this... Um, is UrWeb a compiled language, or is it a uh, um, uh, what's the word? The uh, interpreted. Interpreted. Thank you. Is it, it interpreted? It is a compiled language. Okay, because from compiled, you don't usually get you know immediate feedback. You got to compile it first before and then see what happens. Where with interpretive, you know, you get immediately. You hit the return key or the enter key, and it says nope, you can't do that, or you see the errors. Yeah, so there's a sense in which that's true, but there's also a sense in which the kind of immediate feedback you can get from a compiled language is superior in that the static type checking that happens, where the, the programming language implementation analyzes all these types that you've written on your program and some types that it figured out itself, and sort of once and for all checks all the possible things that could happen when your program runs and tells you if any of those are bad things. So in some sense, you're getting much more immediate feedback by having the language implementation consider all the possible ways your program could run. So we're still not there. It sounds like we're getting there, but we're still not at the language that de that debugs itself. Then it's getting closer, but <laughs> not really there yet. <laughs> no, I right. think there are certain categories of problems that the that the compiler promises to always inform you about, but there are many kinds of problems that uh, that system just doesn't understand and are still up to the programmer to catch. Sure. I mean, a program, you always say, do it. Well, no, well do I guess I, at, at the point where code fixes itself is when you get in trouble with the movies. It's, you know, <laughs> it's thinking, <laughs> my God. Uh, no, I mean, you, you say, to, you know, do what I mean, not do what I said. You know, that that's the mentality. But, of course, that's the uh, that's part of the fun to me with the programming language is, is it's almost like you against the computer because it's going to do exactly what you tell it to do and you think you've told it one thing, and it goes ahead and does something else, and, you, and then you smack yourself in the side of the head. Oh, and then you see the problem, or where, where it happened. But th to me, it's like the ultimate game. I mean, programming. It's just it's, you really getting it. But not it's not for everybody, obviously. You know, uh, 
Some people want to, don't want to know anything about programming. They just want to use the computer, and that's it. Sure. Um, yeah. So you st um, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You were going through these the, the these three things, and you mentioned that first thing. What were the other two? Yeah. Made? So the first one I mentioned was programmer productivity, and then the next one I like to emphasize is security. The Ur Web compiler is able through doing this. Uh, upfront analysis to check whether your application uh, is vulnerable to any of the uh, a set of the most common kinds of security problems mm -hmm. so if the compiler gives your code the, the thumbs up and lets you run it then you know that you uh, don't have to worry about these most common security issues so one example is something called code injection attacks I remember back in the early days of web applications, there was this, this infamous HTML tag called Blink that you could put into your, your code and you'd get blinking text. Yep. And if someone built a web forum and wasn't careful, they might accidentally allow HTML that the user provided to literally be put in the page and they could have blinking messages in their forums when they had no intention to allow such a thing. Uh, thankfully, the Urweb compiler is able to rule out the existence of blink tags in anything that's, that's generated. And, and uh, more seriously, you might be more worried about a web forum where you accidentally give the user a vector to introduce JavaScript code that, that essentially lets one poster to a forum take arbitrary code and run it on the computer of someone else who's reading that forum. And this is a, a pretty serious security problem that the Urweb compiler guarantees uh, can't be present in any of the applications compiled with this system. Mm. So uh, th that, that, that is a, that's a nice feature. Uh, obviously, security uh, is uh, of tantamount importance today on the web and so obviously having a language and getting and getting that kind of security at the language level where the language is actually doing that that's uh, certainly a very good thing um, so that were the three things the, that you were going to mention what was the yeah thing? I can I can finish up with the third one which is a uh, performance the the compiler is able to do upfront analysis of your program and build a, a customized server that is able to serve your application on the web uh, with very good performance which which refers both to the speed of the server and to how much memory it uses and all the other usual things like that and the, the these metrics are very competitive for Ur web com when we look at the the other popular systems out there often a, a single machine is able to serve several times more requests per second with Urweb than with, with some of these popular dynamic scripting languages like Ruby or Python. Mm. Okay. So it's more, you're saying it's more efficient. Right. For a given budget of how much hardware you're able to afford, if you're using Urweb compared to these scripting languages, you can probably support a few times more users, which, which is... Uh, a benefit you reap without having to go to writing in a low-level language like C++, which introduces all of its own complications. Urweb remains a high-level safe language, but has a, a very specialized compiler that's able to deliver some of the performance we expect from low-level languages. Okay, so it is a high-level language. That was, that was going to be my next question, because it certainly sounds like it is. Uh, um, uh, what, what, what was the development? I mean, what did they use to develop Urweb? What was it developed in? The, the compiler for Urweb is implemented in a language called Standard ML, which is a cousin of another language called OCaml, which, which I think is, is more popular today, but neither of them is especially mainstream. <laughs> they're, they're, they're both in the same language family as Urweb, which is the statically typed functional languages. And uh, Standard ML and, Ur and OCaml originated uh, both in roughly the early 80s, I think, and right. they've been gradually increasing their visibility. Yeah, and, there, and, and, and uh, Urweb is completely open source? That's right. The, the implementation is open source. You can download it from the project website, and uh, it's released under a BSD license. Okay. Oh, BSD. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, and, and runs on, what, virtually any platform? Uh, so it, 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 it needs a Unix-style uh, environment. So okay. it, it, the, most of the development and testing is done in Linux. Okay. It's, it's possible to get it up and running in Mac OS X without uh, too much work and with a 
slightly larger amount of work that probably only a few people have succeeded in applying. You can get it running in Windows using uh, a, a a wrapper like Sigwin, which provides a kind of Unix-flavored Windows perspective. You see, this is what Marcel Gagné, that's, he's our Linux con, uh, correspondent, was always saying. He said, most everything out there is run on Linux. You know, the, 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 the web, it's mostly on Linux, and uh, here's another example of, uh, of exactly that. Uh, Mac OS X uh, is really on the Unix and, uh, platform, so it's very, very similar. Uh, the, I, I was not surprised when the next thing you said was Mac OS X, you know, because uh, that's, that's, that's close to it. And then the extra work has to go with Windows. <laughs> it's, it's, it's well, really... luckily, Windows owns the world, so, you know. <laughs> they, they'll come to us, not the other way around. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so I have, I have so many more questions, but we're getting close to the bottom of the hour. Uh, let me just ask you this. Uh, maybe you can just start on it. What are some reasons that programmers might prefer not to use Urweb? Can we just start with that? Yeah, I think a, a, a good reason is someone who wants to get started building web applications with the minimal amount of training in a programming specific knowledge. Mm -hmm. Urweb really requires uh, a fair amount of, of, of practice with the, uh, the core concepts of functional programming. Mm -hmm. And I like to say that you use those other languages if you, if you want to get your program almost right, and then when you're ready to get it, uh, almost entirely right. <laughs> then yeah. you switch over to something like like Urweb or these other similar languages that I've mentioned. Yeah, you know, Adam. One, one of the first things that I remember from my, my my computer science professor was that he said there was there's no such thing as a perfect program. There's always going to be something. You know, it's, you can't ever write a perfect program uh, <laughs> unless things have changed in the past few years. Uh, uh, I think no, the whole program is perfect, but your yeah. uh, your recommendation of your name and the date and the and the <laughs> name of your program is just all wrong. All right, Adam, we're, we're, gonna, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to take a little break and then we'll continue on. Uh, we're talking to assistant professor of computer science, uh, uh, Professor Adam uh, Chapala from MIT. Uh, we're talking about Urweb, a programming language uh, uh, that you may find some interest in, especially if you're into uh, Linux and uh, open source. We're going to take a little break. We've got a News Tips Fools review from Marty Winston coming up. You're listening to the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. Hey, everyone. Have you heard about the no-no hair removal device that's sweeping the globe? If you want to go weeks without shaving and get smooth, professional, quality results, here's our favorite host, Cheryl, for no-no hair removal. Thanks. Hey, gals. I love talking about my no-no. It's this cute little hair removal system that you can take with you and use almost anywhere at home or on the road. No more expensive in-office treatments, painful waxing, and no more wasting your valuable time. Got unwanted facial hair? No-no hair has patented Thermacon technology that works on all hair and skin colors, so it's perfect for using on all body parts. And now you can take advantage of this incredible risk-free trial. Get the No-No, the facial kit, a travel case, and a $100 discount shopping card, and you don't risk a penny to try it. Try the incredible No-No hair completely risk-free. Call 1-800-953-5415. That's 800-953-5415. 800-953-5415. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule, your company's getting ready for its IPO, and you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. So, you came back. This is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, the Seagate ST2000DX001 Desktop SS HD. 
SSHD, not just a hard drive, and not an SSD. You're going to like this. With a special set of storage requirements in mind for populating NAS devices underlying a zero footprint scanning station, we turn to Seagate for their recommendations and a day and a half later receive two of their ST2000DX001 drives with some noteworthy attributes. This is a solid state hybrid drive, SSHD, meaning 8 gig of flash is there as a cache for a big boost in throughput. It's a three and a half inch desktop, two terabyte, 7200 RPM drive with a 64 meg DRAM cache and a six gigabit per second SATA 3, actually 3.1 interface. That's more than enough capacity overhead for our application. It may also be more than enough speed for scanning activities, but that speed makes a significant contribution to speeding up OCR, virus scans, and overnight backup chores. Bottom line, the Seagate Solid State Hybrid 2 terabyte 3.5 inch ST2000DX001 drive puts a premium on speed, less so on price. This is Marty Winston with the New Stiffs Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. It's uh, 33 minutes past the hour. That was Marty Winston with yet another new simple interview. Yeah. Never fails. Always on time. Always with two new ones. Uh, Very and, uh, wow. hmm? That drive sounds really cool. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, we're, we're here and we are talking to uh, Professor Adam uh, uh, Chapala here uh, from MIT. He's the Assistant Professor of Computer Science, as we said before. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the IrWeb, uh, you know, programming, programming language. And you, uh, and Adam, you actually mentioned something earlier about how, uh, you know, it would weed out uh, common security problems in, in codes. And if it, I was wondering if there was anything, you know, more of that than just saying, okay, well, you know, Sure, there's uh, you know, code no, not code injections, um, uh, whatever they were. Anyways, <laughs> like how how do like how 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 do how how do do that? Like, okay, yeah, I'm just messing up. Like, like what what exactly are you doing behind the scenes that makes it so that the most common, um, uh, you know, common security problems are caught? Okay, uh. First thing I want to say, code injections is the right word. So, uh, oh, okay, that was a perfect way to put it. Uh, it and it's as, hard to think about something that you know. <laughs> <laughs> and second, uh, it turns out that code injection attacks are actually really easy to prevent. You just have to make certain basic decisions differently in the design of your language or your web framework. So, if you look at something like PHP, how is HTML code built with PHP? It's all just strings of text that the PHP implementation doesn't know anything about. And you just sort of build little fragments of those, slam them together, put in some bits of text that the user provided, and you might get surprised with the interpretation of some of that user-provided stuff as HTML tags and, and get some very unexpected results. In Urweb, HTML is actually represented as a, a tree. So an HTML, do HTML document is really a, a tree in the, uh, the sense of trees from computer science, where uh, <laughs> yeah. trees grow upside down compared to most of the rest of the world. So you have these uh, tags in your document, and a tag can have other tags nested inside it, and this forms a, a, a tree structure. And in Urweb, those trees are actually represented explicitly as data types with first-class status. And there's no operation to take a string of text and automatically turn it into an HTML tree. So if you're doing something like that, you'll realize you're doing it. And so there, that, among other properties, that means that you'll never get user input accidentally interpreted as JavaScript code because the data type of HTML trees just doesn't have an operator for interpreting text as JavaScript. You have to use the explicit JavaScript tags, which are special constructors of the HTML tree type. Okay. Yeah, Craig, did you follow that? <laughs> yeah. Yes, for the most part. <laughs> All right, just making sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, um, what? So, now I want to ask you this. Uh, we started talking about some of the reasons why programmers might prefer not to use Urweb, and you you started mentioning one. Are there any other uh, reasons why people might not want to use it? 
Well, there aren't as many Ur web programmers out there as for, for any of the, the most widely known languages, so you yeah. would be less likely that someone sitting next to you at work knows how to use Ur web and, and probably harder to hire Ur web programmers, much harder than for, say, Ruby programmers. Well, now is is that a, I mean, if you're in business, I mean that that could be a bad thing. I mean, if you need technical support, or you need help, uh, and uh, your your help pool or availability of knowledgeable people about the thing that your business is using, uh, that could that could be a serious concern to a business, would it not? It absolutely could be. Uh, like for many similar languages, uh, I I like to think that the the average competence of people who do know Ur web is higher so that you can maybe get by with fewer of them. Yeah, but they're all at MIT <laughs> or something. You know? uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a legitimate concern which, which all languages coming out of the research world face in the, the early stages of their life cycles. Uh, a lot of programmers just really enjoy using these languages and will, will go out of their way to find ways to make it work in a commercial context. Okay. And, I can. I, understand that. I mean, I understand that completely, but you know. There, but, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. What I was going to say, but the, but the enjoyment is one thing, but you know, let's face it, we live in a dollars and cents world, and so when you're you're a business, you have to make a crucial decision as to, you know, what kind of support you're going to get for something that's going to uh -huh. be good for your company. Um, I mean, you, <laughs> you it, it would make cause you some hesitation, I would think. Right, but but. I, I would claim that if you have a, a set of programmers who are qualified to be using UrWeb, then they are going to be more efficient mm -hmm. writing your application in UrWeb than in PHP, and that makes a difference for the bottom line of your company. The big if there is getting these programmers who are qualified. Now, is that what they're doing at MIT? You're providing programmers that are uh, that are qualified. I mean, you, you, is this one of the things that you're doing at MIT? Uh, not directly. Mo mostly we're just putting up the open source tools and people around the world are picking them up and using them to build cool things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 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 Real quick, uh, uh, now I, I know some people like to have multiple uh, you know, pro programming languages under their belt and if they, like could someone go out and find resources to kind of uh, guide themselves through learning Urweb, or like, do you do you guys have online resources, or is it strictly in an academic sense where you have to go to you know MIT to learn it? There are a variety of resources on the project website for learning to use the language. There's a tutorial. There's a whole slew of demos of the language with a source code and running versions online. There's a reference manual. It's it's definitely nowhere near the volume of, of documentation and tutorials about something like PHP or, or Ruby. But it's been enough for several people to, to put up real commercial web applications based on Urweb without ever setting foot in MIT. I think some of them have never even set foot in the United States. <laughs> well, I, that I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, some of the programming exper the, the programming expertise seems to be uh, uh, far out, uh, far outpacing what we have here in the U.S. I mean, it's, it's a sad statement to say, but it just seems a lot of the uh, the expertise in the sciences and engineering and programming seems to be coming from, uh, you know, uh, places like India and and uh, other you know other places not. In the you United. can say it, China. <laughs> you know, so uh, we we don't necessarily need to diss the U.S. in that perspective. If we just yeah. imagine the programming talent is distributed evenly over the world, yeah. there, are all, there are all these countries with much larger populations. We should expect them to have their fair shares of great programmers. <laughs> oh, that's not the right attitude. We're America. We're either number one or we're not good enough. That's that's how America runs. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, I, I, I mean, it's obviously, it sounds to me like it's a little bit of a tough nut to crack because, I mean, if you're, you're looking, you know, if you're getting into this or if you, you're an accomplished programmer, it's not, it would, it would be a good thing to have as an additional thing under your belt, but maybe not the only thing, I would think. I, you, I would think you would have to be an accomplished programmer uh, uh, or have some uh, good foundation in, in the programming languages and then say, okay, well, now which direction do I want to go, what else do I want to learn, and something like Urweb or some of these more, I don't, I don't want to use the word exotic, but uh, more hard to find 
uh, languages might be in order. What's your thoughts on that? I, I think that's exactly right. I, I usually advise people to learn some related languages first. Some of the, the most uh, popular functional programming languages today are Haskell and OCaml, and you, a programmer really wants to start with those before going to UrWeb because they do have a larger user communities, more more resources out there, and uh, are simpler in some respects. Did you say Pascal? Did you say Pascal? Oh no, it's it's Haskell, which is spelled H A, uh, -A S K E L L. Okay, I I I thought you said Pascal for a moment. Are they still <laughs> using Pascal? Do they still use that? Uh, uh th there must be plenty of Pascal users out there. Okay. I haven't encountered it personally in a long time. In a long time, yeah. I believe they're in a cave. The last ice age froze them <laughs> over, and they're still fiddling <laughs> on the walls in, well, in Pascal. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna age myself, but I got my my degree in 80, 1982. So the face of everything that, that I ever learned in in the academic that things changed in the past 33 years, Craig. No, 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 don't worry about it. <laughs> Enormously, you know, it's it's just, and I guess it's just the, the the nature of the of the of the animal. I mean, you you want fast change, and 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 you want, but it's but when you when you get your degree, you you, you hit the stopwatch. Now, how long is the, the information I've learned? In the university environment, going to hold up for you know in the real world before it becomes obsolete. Thoughts yeah, on that? We, we like to think there are some general principles you can learn to be prepared for new programming language developments as they arise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, C sale. Uh, tell us a little bit about C sale itself. Uh, uh, what is it you do at C sale, and what 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 are they what are they doing at, at, over there? Well, what, what I do is, is run a research group with graduate students and, and others uh, who, where we are working on building better tools for programmers. And most of the work we do has something of a mathematical flavor of trying to, to bring uh, the equivalent of the, the math that engineers in classical engineering disciplines use to the world of programming to provide stronger guarantees about the behavior of programs and ideally to reduce the the cost of creating programs that behave acceptably. All right. Well, not not not. I don't mean to throw you a curve here when I ask this next question because it's not it's not one of the questions we talked about. But I, I've got to ask you this. I mean, in, sure. We're getting into the age. You know, we're, we're talking about encryption and everything. And and I've always maintained that you know because when you always have it, you 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 make an encryption code and then but then they come up with mathematical formulas to break the code and they make stronger encryption. So it's like the old lock and key syndrome. You know that's been going on for for hundreds of years with locksmiths, and and we're seeing the same thing with 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 codes and encryption. Yeah. And I've always maintained, or at least I believe, that uh, when we start entering the area of quantum computing and quantum codes, that uh, that that may actually hold uh, the final uh, the final end. In other words, because the fact that you're observing anything that uh, basically changes it, uh, which is the simplest premise behind that. Um, what you, uh, any thoughts on on uh, you know quantum computing and the, where that's going to be heading and something that you might be doing over there at MIT. Well, I have colleagues who work on quantum computing, but I'm not at all qualified to comment on its its prospects for the future. Yeah. Uh, 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 just uh, responding to what you were saying about cryptographic codes being broken, mm -hmm. that there is a well-established field of mathematical cryptography that that proves theorems about the strength of different cryptographic systems, generally there are some assumptions that some simpler system is, is secure, but then from that assumption you can deduce that the more complex system is secure and not have to worry that you made some boneheaded mistake in constructing that more complex system. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure people are, are constructing quantum crypto systems and doing similar kinds of proofs uh, in that domain, but I don't know any of the details personally. Okay. But are they doing that over at MIT? Uh, they, I assume you have uh, areas of X that are working on that. Yeah, we have we have a number of of faculty at MIT working on quantum computing with some some applications to cryptography. Uh, I I believe Professor Peter Shore is a member of our. Let me check if he's if he's in our lab. But he he invented uh, a famous quantum algorithm for for factoring numbers. I think which has uh, applications to cryptography. And uh, that sentence is about the extent of my understanding of that work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean because they're making quantum leaps because you know it's not using traditional mathematical models. They're you're, you're, you're using this whole 
uh, different science to come up with things that uh, that were you know, uh, thought to be impossible, really. And then the and and uh, uh, to me, it also holds a, a certain amount of fascination. I figured, you know, hey, you're from MIT, you might know something about it. So uh, that's why I figured I would just I would throw it out at you and say, but uh, um, see, when you say all that, I'm just thinking in my head, hmm, magic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it might be considered that you know when you when you see some of the things they they that you know the strange effects of things and the non intuitive that goes it might as well be magic you know um, I mean when it you seems have, like magic to me definitely <laughs> it is I mean, you know it's it's just mind boggling um, okay so what let me get back to your questions what kinds of code reuse are easier to implement in Urweb than uh, with related tools yeah so. My impression is that a lot of, of what web programmers do today is, is implement more or less the same code over and over again with small variations. And one of my goals in, in Urweb is to support more principled patterns of, of code reuse so you can avoid doing the same thing over and over again. But one of the challenges in, in, in doing that, you're, you're trying to build something that's useful uh, and very general. To, it's ready to adapt to all the different kinds of applications you'd like to build. And a, a challenge in getting that thing right is when you're trying to debug it, you only, you're only able to test it in a, a small set of different circumstances. And one thing that the Urweb compiler can do is if effectively give you a guarantee about how your very generic piece of code is going to operate when placed in uh, an infinite number of different contexts. So one popular example is building a simple admin interface for your, your database table. So think of these tables as like a spreadsheet in Excel with a v variety of columns holding values of different data types. Mm -hmm. You might want some generic functionality that for, for any table or any spreadsheet-like thing, builds an admin interface to view the contents and modify those contents. These, that kind of code is traditionally written in a, a style of sort of ad hoc generation of text that happens to be program code and it's very hard to debug that kind of complicated program. In Urweb, the compiler can actually check that kind of code for you to make sure it will output correct secure code regardless of which table you actually apply it to and that those general features can can be extended to a variety of different kinds of generic functionality that need to be specialized to the data of your application. Well, I mean, for example, one of the uh, business languages that I learned back was COBOL, you know, Common Oriented Business business Language, and, course, and it was almost like programming in words. Uh, that was the feel you had your procedure, you had the different divisions, you know, and, and then, um, and of course, if you, uh, uh, are you saying that, that programs that were written in, in, in that language or in those are, are harder um, to reuse, I mean, because you had like certain subroutines that you could use over and over again for different applications. They were like libraries, really, of code that you could use, um, and, and you use them for like building blocks. You're saying that really is outdated. That that really doesn't make sense anymore. Libraries of, of subroutines are are still one of the the, the basic weapons of effective programming. Uh -huh. uh, what, what Urweb does is enables different kinds of subroutines that take different kinds of arguments. And one of the kinds of arguments they can take is a description of what kind of, of data tables your application uses. And the Urweb compiler is able to check uh, once and for all that no matter what kind of data table description you feed into this function, the mm -hmm. function behaves reasonably. And that's a feature that, that's generally beyond the mainstream statically typed languages like Java. Their compilers aren't smart enough to understand the consequences of the full range of possible data definitions ahead of time. Well, all right. Now, here, why don't you, <coughs> could you give us some real websites out there that are already built using Urweb that, uh, that our listeners could go to and, and check out? Say for themselves. Or at the end of the day, would that not even matter? Because the coding behind the scenes really isn't affecting the end user experience. Well, it's def definitely true that that Urweb is designed to uh, allow it to be used to deploy applications where your users will not know you're doing anything unusual in how you coded the application. So, uh, for a concrete example of an Urweb application, I'd like to suggest going to bazquux.com. That's spelled B-A-Z-Q-U-X. And what you'll find there is a feed reader for viewing uh, 
RSS and Atom feeds, uh, which are basically ways for websites to publish little units of content that users can then combine together to produce custom feeds of updates from all the websites that they're watching. And so Bazquox Reader is a, an application built by a guy named Vladimir Shabanov. I, I hope I got his name reasonably right. It, uh, <laughs> it saw an uptick in popularity after a system called Google Reader closed. It provides a very similar kind of functionality. I was going to say, it looks just a lot like what you see on Google. I mean, look, uh, when I'm looking at the image here, you know, it looks like a Google page of some sort. Yep. And uh, if you have a, a Google account or a Facebook account or any of those options it displays, you can sign in with one of those and you can start subscribing to updates from your favorite websites. You can view the comments others have posted on those updates and it all runs inside this application. There's integration with uh, mobile apps and the other stuff that people expect from this category of application. It's, it's implemented in a mix of Urweb and also Haskell, which is one of the related languages that I talked about. Okay. Uh, can you give us another one? Uh, the, this looks pretty static. Is there anything else that people could go on and see you know, running right, right away rather than this? Well, well, I wouldn't call this one static. Well, I mean, I guess the page I'm at, that, at there, I'm, I'm just I'm seeing the comments and everything. I, just, I guess I have to sign in and try it. Yeah, you have to pick one of the sign-in options. Then you get the more dynamic version. Got it. Okay. Uh, but uh, so, so the, the Urweb project site that has a, a list of production applications, uh, one, one more that I'll mention is the Bitcoin merge mining pool. So B Bitcoin is one of the hot things in the in the tech news lately. Oh, we've talked and, about it funny, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I don't understand all the details completely, but there's this concept in Bitcoin called a, a mining pool yep. where a, a group of people get together to all mine Bitcoins towards uh, some sort of common goal. And Making they, money. <laughs> it's a common uh, that, goal. Exactly. that sounds like a good goal, yeah. yeah and but, but it requires an enormous amount of computational power and 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 a huge investment. And I think there's it's sort of tipping. The, uh, the well, the pool is is meant for the individual to jump into a pool and then you share the results of you know right. a bunch of people. Yeah. Right. So this particular pool uh, uses a, an Urweb application where I think roughly every successful mining event leads to a call to the web API in this Urweb application, and uh, maybe it was in 2013 or so. Uh, I can look up this exact number. It was something like 10% of, of Bitcoin mining went through this application. Wow, that's that's a lot, yeah. But uh, I, th I think things have changed since then in terms of people using specialized hardware for Bitcoin mining, and, and somehow this group... Uh, do, doesn't command as large a share of the total anymore, but it, but at some point they were uh, a big fraction of the total activity, and everything was running through this or web application. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The uh, the face of Bitcoin uh, mining, everything that is changing. Uh, so because you know people all jumping onto the opportunity, and that opportunity is changing, and it's getting the it's getting smaller and smaller because there's only a limited number of bitcoins out there. Um, so. Uh, so again, now, so if people want more information uh, about uh, Urweb, uh, Adam, or what you're doing over at CSAIL, uh, I assume they can go to the uh, uh, MIT website. Um, I have one that uh, uh, here at um, uh, it's um, the MIT Computing website, CSAIL. We actually have the link to it. It's uh, www.csail.mit.edu, which is the, the, the website there. And um, you can see this for yourself. Uh, if you don't worry, just go to computeramerica.com, click on our show notes button, and uh, you'll see today's show, March the 3rd, and uh, you'll uh, see uh, uh, MIT and Adam's name there, and then there's a link there to CSAIL. Uh, just click it, and it'll actually take you to the CSAIL website so you can read more about it, the research being done there, and uh, that stays up forever, so uh, that's all you really need to, to do. To, if, if this interests you and you want to find more, find out more about it, you certainly can do that. Uh, I also happen to be blessed with an internet unique name that you can just type into Google and find me very easily. Oh, Mr. Apollo, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you, you need the Adam part for it to be unique, but yeah. uh, close enough. <laughs> does your name get auto, uh, does your name get autocorrected to uh, Chipotle? <laughs> <laughs> I have not experienced that yet, but I couldn't blame a system that did that. <laughs> <laughs> that exactly. 
Hey, Adam, look, it was a real pleasure having you here on the show. Uh, I, I think what you're doing, obviously, is, is incredibly fascinating. I suppose because uh, you know I love programming, so this is kind of near and dear to me, and I'm going to check uh, more into it myself. But a lot of our listeners, of course, uh, also into programming. Uh, perhaps we've uh, put them onto something different. I know one of the one of our uh, participants in the chat room, uh, Jonathan, is, is is actually familiar with the. Uh, with uh, 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 Urweb and uh, evidently has looked into it a little bit. So, you know, uh, 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 certainly. Glad you're here getting the word out, and we yeah. are honored to help you with that. Yeah, well, you uh, thank you for giving me the chance to talk about Urweb here. Exactly, and, and thank you again so much for being with us here on the uh, Computer America Show. Adam, it was a pleasure having you on the program. Okay, thank you. All right, take care. Have a good evening. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. All right, there you go. Uh, 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 again, uh, Urweb is the name of the programming language. Uh, Adam is still in the chat room. If you want to uh, uh, correspond with him, he's in there right now. MIT is, uh, professor. He is a uh, an assistant professor of computer science. Uh, a unique opportunity to talk to him like that. Uh, uh, trust me, those opportunities don't come along very very often. Much much cheaper than tuition. Yes, exactly. So uh, you know, take advantage of it. He's going to be in the, he's in the chat room right now. He may stay in there for a little bit to, to talk with you. And uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so coming up in the next hour, we're going to have computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. Uh, again, let me just remind all of you: go to our contest page at computeramerica.com. All of our contests are up in full swing. We just started it. Last night, Logitech, we have not one, not two, but three great prizes from Logitech. Uh, they're the webcams, the, the uh, gaming mice, uh, we've got the, the, uh, the Bluetooth uh, handheld speakers that we're giving away. Um, all of it is up there at the Logitech website, and you don't have to send us an email anymore. The registration form is right on the Logitech page. So enter and get, get your entries in now. Enter in all of our contests. We have our show reminder winner. Uh, we give away a, a glass touchpad, wireless touchpad from Logitech, valued at $80 um, every Friday. All of our contests are there. They're all private. We give your information out to no one, uh, except if you're a winner. So they'll we'll give them your contact info so they can send you your prize. Enter in all of them, and you'll have a lot of fun doing so. Who knows? You might win something really, really nice. Okay, hour two is right around the corner, and uh, we're going to continue on. This is the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, on the Boost Radio Network, on the IRN Radio Network. Uh, Computer and Technology News is uh, next. That's coming up. And uh, we will be right back just in a few moments. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at computeramerica.com. Hello and welcome into hour two of the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show and I'm your host Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host Ben. And uh, Adam still, is still in the chat room. I mean he's still there. He must be a glutton for punishment. <laughs> so no. Uh, I know he's chatting with a lot of people in there. Again, a unique opportunity to, to chat with him and talk a little bit about it. Uh, find out more about web, uh, Urweb, the programming language that we discussed. Um, and he, as I said, he's still in the uh, Computer America chat room. And you, get, you can get that right from our homepage at computeramerica.com. Uh, a lot of fun. I enjoyed that hour immensely. We need to do more like this. Uh, I, I believe you know that was set up by Carissa, our yeah. booking goddess. So uh, I believe getting uh, not just you know some, not just businesses that you know benefit the end user, but also uh, guests such as Adam, who are doing things not just for consumer you know technology, but just technology in general that we find interesting and hope that you find interesting as well. We should be getting more of those. That's uh, that's something new we're trying. Right, and uh, uh, <laughs> let me just type something here real fast. Um, <laughs> yep. No, it's uh, yeah. So again, thanks, Adam, and uh.
but that was the first hour. We have a whole nother hour of the Computer America show to do. Okay, that's right. So we're going to do computer news. Uh, and uh, hey, uh, when is that movie, the uh, uh, the Age of Ultron, uh, the Avengers? Is that coming out this week? The Avengers two is that coming out soon already? Yeah, it's going to be out in March. I know, uh, and uh, there's a lot of publicity about it. It's going to be a that's going to be the the blockbuster summer uh, movie. Let's I see. think. Whoa, wait. Let's look up March 2015. Uh, the movie releases. So this would be this weekend. Chappie. <laughs> Chappie. I, that's Chappie's coming out this, this I weekend. I By the way, Chappie, rated R, apparently. Well, he uses some bad language, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Good for Chappie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, th there are a couple others. Uh, Unfinished Business. Um, I haven't really seen so much of that. Uh, Cinderella. The, the I think it's a live-action Cinderella coming out. Yeah. Uh, 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 next yeah. next week? Yeah, that's Will, uh, Will Ferrell is in that. <laughs> so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I think you're going to like it. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, okay, so uh, the Diversion series, Insurgent, is coming out oh, I, March I'm, 20th? Yeah, yeah. And that never. I, I watched it. I just didn't like it. I, that didn't go. Uh, no, the I, Gunman and the last one, Home and, and uh, Get Hard, which are both comedies as well. So oh. uh, There's a few, but uh, no, I don't see uh, Age of Ultron coming out oh, this. Uh, Adam's in the chat. He says Age of Ultron is May 1st. <laughs> May, May 1st, not March. Yeah. May. There we go. He's 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 in the movies too. He uh, he's obviously uh, he's, he just got it from uh, I am more than us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I'm I really chappy. You know, the artificial intelligence and a robot. To me, that's a. Uh, I wonder if they used Ur Web with Chappie. Could be. <laughs> mm, I think it, I think it might be more Hollywood magic than programming language in yeah. that one. No, but you, you we we can you can dream. You know, you know that uh, to have a sentient robot one day. I think it's gonna be amazing. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll be around. Maybe you'll be around. I don't know to see that happen. Oh, oh Craig, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure before the time comes, they'll, they'll have the technology to chop off your head and freeze it and revive it in another time. So, let's hope. You know, uh, I'm thinking Futurama right now, where they put all the heads in the jars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, let's do some computer news. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Tonight's computer and technology news is brought to you by Slimmer Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. You can visit them at slimwareutilities.com to clean, speed up, and optimize your Windows system for... For free. For free. That's right. Exactly. Everything at slimwareutilities.com is completely free. Um, you don't buy it and then pay them later. You don't no trial periods. It's all free. There are no freemium models. Um, check them all out. Download them all. Why not? They're all free. Uh, use the ones that you want. Have the others in reserve if you need when you need them. You know, uh, you'll be happy that you did, and you'll thank us for it. SlimmerUtilities.com. And in this first story uh, tonight, um, Apple Pay. Apple Pay. Uh, which looks really cool, is being hit by a surprising amount of fraud. Dun, dun, dun. Fraud? Fraud? No. Yes, it's a rampant problem in the credit card industry. And while technology like Apple Pay was supposed to improve the security of our finances, it turns out that it's only as secure as the people that back it. Now, a report in The Guardian says that Apple Pay, the new payment system that works on the company's iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, has proved to be surprisingly susceptible to fraud. However, it's not the technology itself that's being compromised. Rather than targeting the security of transactions, thieves are instead convincing banks to let them use other people's cards on their phones. In other words, it's more social. It's more of a social engineering thing. It's not a technology thing. They're using social engineering to to, to kind of bludgeon their way into this stuff. Uh, here, adding a card for use in Apple Pay requires a bank's approval, okay? However, many banks have been falling down on the job by requiring little personal information in order to verify the identity of the requester. For example, some banks are asking only for the last four digits of a social security number, which is relatively easy for thieves to acquire these days. I remember when, when the Social Security Administration actually came out with a database with everybody's social security number. I remember when they did that. And the outcry that went up when that happened, they pulled that sucker down so fast. But it was up there for a while. You could actually go to the social security website and, and look up somebody's social security number. 
Uh, or, well, I guess in the days before, uh, you know, all these form filling out and all this, uh, and how easy and common identity yeah. theft was, I guess it really didn't cross our mind that, hey, why are we doing all of the bad guys work for them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that was it. It was amazing, you know. But you're right. It was in a time where we were still innocent of uh, what was really out there, what was, was getting ready to, uh, the, to be out there, so... Anyway, banks and credit card companies can choose to require more information before approving a card for use on Apple Pay, but currently many don't, probably presuming that it will help with adoption of the new technology. Unfortunately, that's proving to be a boon for fraudsters as well. Um, Apple Pay is not likely to be alone in these problems. Samsung recently purchased payment uh, company Loop Pay to power its new Samsung Pay service, and Google has announced it's working on its own Android Pay platform. All of these will probably require some interaction with banks to be useful. So it's time for the banks to catch up and start requiring more stringent security checks. Apple, for its part, told The Guardian that those institutions are always reviewing and improving, uh, and improving their pr approval process. No surprise there. It's in banks' own interest as they are the ones who are going to get hit with the resulting fraudulent charges. Once those changes are made, okay, once those changes are made, all of our finances stand to get a lot more secure. And there you go. And again, that's from Popular Science. Good article uh, by D by Dan Morin. Yep. No matter how secure you make it, if you know if the people using it aren't safe, social engineering is going to trump any kind of programming you do to it. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so um, let's. All right. So that's the, the, uh, you know. I, I don't have a, a uh, an iPhone 6 or 6 Plus yet, but uh, it does look fun, like fun, and uh, hopefully eventually we'll get one and, and really use it. Yep. So, okay. Yep. And uh, and apparently they're wildly popular too because of, of the larger screen. So that's that's another draw. Um, well, this uh, this next story that I got, it's uh, Jamai. We did something about them last night uh, involving their seven inch. I'm going to use the word phone, but. Um, it's more of a small tablet with phone capabilities. Yeah, we did that story. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that story yeah. last night. Yeah. yeah, we did that last night. So uh, tonight they actually released another product that is uh, I see actually useful, and they have it strapped to the back of a cat. So you know it's extremely <laughs> useful. Uh, Xiaomi launches a sixty-four dollar action camera that can outshoot the GoPro Hero. The GoPro oh. Hero, by the way, is uh, selling for. Uh, 130 bucks, so almost twice. Mm -hmm. What this one's selling for? Okay. So the Chinese, so the Chinese smartphone giant uh, Xiaomi has uh, launched a new action cam to rival the GoPro Hero, based in China. Uh, they call it the Yi Action Camera. Y I Action Camera. Okay. Won't be available outside of Xiaomi's home country, but is selling for the impressively low price of sixty-four dollars, and oh. offers some eye-catching specs to match. The, Go the new device Go hmm? Pro, GoPro is typically right three hundred, four hundred dollars per uh, for camera. For yeah, the they're uh, some of the uh, higher models with like the cases for the extreme yeah. sports and, and and the mounts and stuff like that. Usually go for about three or four hundred dollars, sometimes up to six hundred. Yeah. But uh, the, the GoPro Hero was their, which you talked about when it first came out, was their low cost budget solution, which still shot 1080p video, but mm -hmm. was uh, much more mod moderately specced. And so the GoPro Hero actually sells for 130 as opposed to this thing 64. So, uh, you know, the new device shows that the company's ambition to move beyond the smartphone market and offer consumers the chance to buy in, uh, to buy in, I'm sorry, uh, to a larger ecosystem of Xiaomi products. Uh, you know, they said that the E the itself features a 16 megapixel camera, which is crazy good, and capable of shooting 1080p video at 60 frames per second. Also really good. Uh, which you know better, which actually has better specs than the $130 uh, GoPro Hero, and un and unexpectedly for such a cheap device, the E also uses a high quality image sensor from Sony, and offers 64 gigabytes of built-in storage, twice what's available in the Hero. Uh, like GoPro's offering, E can be used up to 40 meters underwater, mm. and comes with a smartphone app that can remotely control the camera as well as edit and share newly captured footage. So you know it doesn't. Uh, the E doesn't ship with any basic cases or rigging. Although Xiaomi is offering a travel edition for an extra uh, 100 Chinese yen, 
that comes bundled with a selfie stick because the selfie stick really crucial at this point. If your camera doesn't come with a selfie stick, you might as well just throw away the camera. Uh, and uh, they said that it will have a, a rich variety of accessories that you can connect the to uh, helmets, bikes, even pets. Uh, and yes, they do have a picture of a cat wearing it in some kind of jumpsuit looking deal. He looks, um, miserable. He looks miserable. It's supposed to be saying, oh. you know, why am I wearing this thing? <laughs> oh, I'm sure the cat was mad before, but now he just looks downright miserable. It's, <laughs> this is what my life has become. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yep. So, although there's no word on whether ye whether the ye will ever come to the U.S., it's impossible not to notice that it handily beats the GoPro Hero in both price and specs. Uh, this is a result of the company's strategy of offering high-end devices at razor-thin margins. Well, it's China. What what else is new? It's you not know? just China. It's yeah. Chinese manufactured and Chinese and and a Chinese company. Yeah. Producing these things, so like it's not even like an American company saying, "Okay, we need to cut costs somewhere, ship it off to China." No, this is starting at the source, China, manufactured at the source, China, and then being marketed to Chinese people. Again, uh, this camera, as of this moment, is only being marketed towards uh, Chinese, you know, to yeah, yeah, to the Chinese market. So hopefully there will be a port over to uh, over to the U.S. I'm thinking worst case scenario, there's always a secondhand market where you know you can actually eBay is a big one where you can actually purchase these devices that are only available in China, get them sent over. Although it looks like all the instructions and uh, everything might only be available only be available in Chinese. So uh, brush up on your Chinese, your your Mandarin, if you want to use this camera. Yeah, uh, I I I agree. I think it, it looks really cool, but again, you're not going to be able to buy it here in the U.S. anyway. So, not even on Amazon. No, you won't be able to do that. Okay, uh, this story from TechHive: Bluetooth starts weaving its mesh for the Internet of Things. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, backers of Bluetooth plan to give the technology a way to form mesh networks dramatically extending its range and potentially its role in the Internet of Things. Bluetooth is well suited to the Internet of Things because of its low power capability and its inclusion in smartphones and many other devices. It's just everywhere, quite frankly. So, but its reach has been limited to the practical range of, of a Bluetooth radio, which is about 30 meters. Uh, it doesn't have much of a range. It was never intended to be a long range solution. It's just you know, about 30 meters and that's about it. Um, because it needs to organize itself in hub and spoke networks. That's another reason. Uh, other energy sipping networks such as Zigbee and Six Low Pan can already form wider networks just by linking client devices together. But you know they're not as common as Bluetooth. I said just about every cell phone out there has Bluetooth uh, one verb, uh, form of another built into it. Okay. Uh, uh, Adam is uh, leaving the uh, chat room, so I'm just saying good night to him and thanking him. Okay, uh, and he's gone. Um, so uh, where were we? Oh, meshes mean that connected things such as thermostats and lights can communicate without going through a nearby PC or or dedicated hub device. So networks are easier and less expensive to build. That's a key capability that led the Thread Group, the IoT networking alliance formed by Google's Nest Group and other heavy hitters, to turn to Slow pan, I guess that's how it's pronounced, slow pan, even though that technology is less widely available than Bluetooth. Thread devices will be able to automatically form their own networks, the group says. Uh, the Bluetooth special interest group, as expected, is now trying to get in on the mesh game. Uh, today, it announced the formation of the Bluetooth smart mesh working group to develop a mesh feature that could start showing up in products next year. That wouldn't be too late for Bluetooth to become the network of choice in home uh, uh, Internet of Things products, uh, um, said it's a, a current uh, analyst. Uh, most consumers don't even know why they would want the Internet of Things, and I think that's true. People still don't, a lot of people don't know about it. Is it like, I'm oh, sorry. No, uh, it, you. Yeah, it, it it seems kind of uh, counterintuitive because we, we've been talking about the Internet of Things so much because you know uh, we ha we have Intel on the show. We've had uh, many actually hardware manufacturers talking about the Internet of Things. Uh, it, it seems like a big buzzword, but at the end of the day, if you go out 
to uh, Best Buy, Walmart, wherever you like to meet your uh, quote unquote common the, the the common folk, the peasantry. Um, yeah, they they still have no idea what the Internet of Things is. Uh, now that's, that that uh, analyst said, I doubt you're going to see the market take off so much this year that it's going to drive one technology versus another. I I, I would, would agree with him there. Uh, the new capability is intended mostly for products that use Bluetooth Smart, the low power version of the standard that can run for years on the equivalent of a watch battery. Holy mackerel! I didn't know about that. It can run. They, you know, Bluetooth Smart evidently is a low pro power version of of Bluetooth that can run for years, years on the equivalent of a watch battery. That's that's amazing. Um, Although I I don't get why that would be necessary. Well, well, it's those devices. Well, if it's for, uh, yeah. well, you know, finish that sentence and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, if it's it's those devices such as sensors and light bulbs that would gain the most from mesh networking, it's likely that most devices with Bluetooth Smart that are already in use will be software upgradable for mesh. Okay, so then again, senior director marketing for the Bluetooth uh, Sig. Like I don't understand why they have to have low power version. Like I get it if they wanted to, you know, kind of market it that hey, this is going to be just as low low power as a non-connected device. But at the end of the day, if it's only using that much power, why is that even necessary? Because most appliances are plugged into the wall. Yeah, that's well, but not all. Uh, not all are. And, and not all. Like uh, lamps. Uh, dishwashers, coffee makers, microwaves, crockpots, like they're all plugged into the wall. I don't see why there has to be a low power version of it. Like, yay, they, they reduce power. Less power, good. But if it means that they're pulling back on some features that might be more beneficial and they're cutting them because, hey, that's just wasting power that they can't spare. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, let's see what it says here. Uh, in addition to linking devices and appliances around the home, which you just mentioned that are all probably plugged in, Bluetooth meshes could be used in for industrial, automotive, and mobile applications. Uh, those could include asset tracking, security, and heating and cooling control. It's likely that thousands of devices could participate in a Bluetooth mesh. Okay. Uh, Bluetooth vendors seem anxious to start meshing. More than 80 companies have volunteered to serve in the new working group, one of the biggest uh, turnarounds of any such group in Bluetooth's history. Uh, Chipmaker CSR has already implemented its own form of mesh networking called CSR Mesh for Bluetooth smart devices for home automation and other areas. Qualcomm agreed to buy CSR for $2.5 billion, billion, billion dollars last October. I know, we throw, out, we, we throw around the word billions so much, but that's a lot of money. Yes, it is. It's a thousand million. And it, yep, it's a thousand million. There, there are a thousand millionaires that are fitting onto like five long buses, and that's one billionaire taking a cab. It's, that's, it's a lot of money. Anyways, uh, but yeah, meshing is apparently getting more and more popular, and it sounds like rightfully so. It, it's, it sounds way more stable than a Wi-Fi network, and you're not clogging up a Wi-Fi network because. Obviously, Wi-Fi is going to work better for certain things, web browsing and things like that. But for just things that need to communicate and send, send and receive data, a mesh network is going to be much more stable. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody in the chat room just said I should splash water on my face. I wonder why. Do I look tired? I don't feel tired. All right. <laughs> Greg, you're Greg, you're beautiful. Don't change a thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're listening to uh, Computer Technology News, brought to you by Slimware Utilities. Uh, what else? America. We should change the show to Beauty America. Beauty America. Okay. <laughs> what do we got Anyways, next? So, uh, what do we got next? Although, I do like the idea of mesh networking. I feel like we're going to be talking about that more in the future, because mm -hmm. mesh networking is... Uh, it, it sounds just as important as... Uh, oh, whatchamacallit? Uh, quantum dot technology? Oh, that's something I'm looking for. That's for the, the yeah. The well, I think mesh mesh networking is going to be just as important. Really, it's quantum. In, 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 in terms of networks, because yeah. uh, Wi-Fi, let's face it, it's good. Penetrates through walls, perfect. But it uh, it has a lot of security flaws. One, because it has to, and two, uh, 
eh, has a lot of security flaws. So, and, and it's probably not as stable as a mesh network, so let's hope that takes off and we hear more about that later on. Uh, but yeah, we're doing computer technology news. Yeah, Jonathan, and, uh, Jonathan uh, oh, I see. Mark said he caught me yawning. I yawn, I'm sorry. How rude of me. Um, but, cover uh, your mouth, sir. Cover your mouth. Exactly. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't mean when you yawn. I mean cover your mouth like when you're talking. Okay. Anyways, uh, wait, uh, wait, wait. Uh, Jonathan wants to know, and I don't know. He says he can't see you because he, he wants to know if you were using your blue microphone. I said no. You you have your headset mic. I said can't you see it? Can't you see him? He says he can't see you for some reason. I see it. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's a mystery of the universe. Maybe maybe because he has uh, Google Hangouts, it's doing something weird. But anyways, uh, no, I'm not using my beautiful, beautiful blue digital microphone because, uh, unfortunately, I do not have the proper stand equipment for it, and I would have to either lean down or hold it up to my face for two hours, and I'm not willing to make that kind of commitment right now. So yeah. uh, sometime in the near future. I got some really cool stainless steel headphone, headphones as well. Yeah, he's saying that Hangouts isn't panning to you. Now, obviously, when you talk, we're supposed to see you, and, and uh, but evidently he says it's not happening. Go ahead, talk. Let me see if it goes... Hmm. Uh, no, it, it it says, or at least on my screen, it's you know panning to me. So I'm no, okay. No, right? No, I don't. It's it's usually when you talk, I see you, but I'm not seeing you. He's right. Uh, I'm not, when you're talking, I I don't know what to tell you. Anyways, that's right. uh, neither here nor there. I am there on Google, or yeah, Google Hangouts. So you know, find me there. Anyways, we're doing stories. We're doing stories, stories, stories. Uh, how about this one, Craig? Have you ever heard of Metallica? Uh, the uh the music group, of course. Yes, the yeah. music group Metallica. Yeah. Um. Well, they're uh, they're famous of sorts. They they've put out a song or two, and um, yeah, apparently this one from Gadget, Metallica is releasing a remastered 1982 demo, but it's on the best uh, distribution platform out there. Really? It's on cassette. 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 Really? C A S S E T T E cassette. Wow. Yeah. So dust off your tape players, folks. Cassettes are still making a comeback. A number of independent artists have already leveraged the classic format, and Metallica is looking to join the bandwagon. The Metal Act re recorded the seven-track "No Life Till Leather" demo back in 1982, and the effort will be uh, will be released on April 18th as a limited edition cassette. Because, let's face it, who wants a cassette? I'm glad it's limited edition. Uh -huh. Go away, cassette. Uh, if you tossed out the boombox a long time ago, the remastered tunes will be available on CD and vinyl this summer. This is the first time that any of the band's demo material has been officially released, and it's the first in a series of reissues planned through Blackened uh, Recordings, a Metallica-owned label. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have a quote here. It's a uh, quote. It's time for us to put out some next level reissues and do the song and dance of the catalog that everyone else has done. The U2s and the Led Zeppelins and the Oasis. Uh, that was from Lars Ulrich. Uh, he told that to Rolling Stones. Instead of starting uh, with uh, with Kill 'Em All in 1983, we figured we'd go back another two years to when the band was formed in 1981, and they actually have. A picture. It's something that you can print out on. I'm assuming you get a uh, a certain kind of label. You print it out on cassette labels, and it has Metallica. It has like the the handwritten uh, tracks. Like if anyone had ever uh, you know put music on a cassette, you had to kind of write down song number one is so and so, song number two is so and so, and put the label on. Well, they have it all printed out here for you. Because let's face it, if you just started listening to Metallica, let's say you're 15 years old and you're just getting into them, that means that you came in about four or five years after the CD revolution. You've never used a cassette in your life, and they're just re-releasing them. So some of their fans may never have even you know, used a cassette. What's a cassette? What's a cassette? It's really <laughs> close up there with a floppy drive. I would think so. Uh... Uh, I, I've I've actually uh, I I saw that somewhere where, where a kid had never seen a cassette before. He wanted to know what it was. I saw that someplace. It, it, it was real. I mean, he had actually never seen a cassette before. Uh, well, CDs kind of came in and cleaned house, which was inevitable. So 
Yeah. Uh, see, well, yeah, I know the mini disc player. That was Tony's attempt, and that didn't work though. Uh, oh wait, well, was that like the mini cassettes? Yeah, it was a mini disc player, but it had random access. You didn't have to start at the beginning. You could you could get ac- yeah access anywhere onto it. I had a mini disc player for a number of years. I, I was because you could record. And you could play back uh, on the on on. Greg, the, you were so cool back then. What happened? I don't know. Wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Just fell by the wayside. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, here, here's something from Ars Technica. Um, Qualcomm, you know, has evidently unveiled its answer to Apple's Touch ID, and it is called Ultrasonic. Fingerprint scanning, ultrasonic. Is I didn't. It, I didn't know Apple's uh, Touch ID was uh, was a question in need of answering. Yeah, it's the same tech that's used in ultrasonic medical imaging. It's just it's a lot smaller. Uh, so at the Mobile World Congress, uh, Qualcomm is showing off Sense ID, a new technology that brings ultrasonic fingerprint scanning to mobile devices. The main advantage of ultrasonic fingerprint scanning is that because it uses sound waves, it doesn't require direct contact with your finger. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay. This means the ultrasonic sensor can be underneath the device's front cover glass or potentially underneath the display itself. That's kind of slick. Kind of slick? Yeah. Uh, I I hope it won't microwave your finger, though. Um, We can only hope. Yeah. Well, Well, like chicken fingers. Yeah, while digital fingerprint sensors have been around for years, uh, they were po- popularized in the mobile space by the iPhone 5S with Touch ID. Uh, the Touch ID sensor, along with the various other fingerprint sensors that have appeared on smartphones over the last couple of years, are all based on capacitive technology. It means you have to touch it. Okay? Uh, they work in the same way as the touch screen, pretty much. You place your finger on the reader, the pattern of the ridges... Uh, whirls and m- minutia points create electrical circuits that can be read and recorded. This method works just fine, but it has limitations. Your finger needs to be in direct contact with the sensor, and if you have contaminations like water, lotion, dirt on your finger... <laughs> so you said contamination, like, yeah, I, I, I really do find it hard to open my iPhone with my fingerprints after I've been eating Cheetos and Doritos. Exactly. It, just doesn't re- it just doesn't read it right. It doesn't read it right. It, it, it happens. So. But because ultrasonic fingerprint recognition uses high-frequency sound waves, it can penetrate through a variety of obstacles, including uh, Cheetos. Glass, thank metal, you. plastics. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we needed. So there it is. Okay. Uh, they're using sound. It's coming up. Uh, Sense ID is coming up from uh, uh, Qualcomm's uh, phones. Hey, we got another news test bulletin review from Marty Winston coming up. You're listening to the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. Their mission is to protect and enhance the lives of companion animals and the people who love them. Their no-kill rescue shelter is open year-round, making it easy for people to adopt their best new friend. This year, Brother Wolf will find homes for over 2,400 orphan dogs, puppies, cats, and kittens. All have ended up as an orphan through no fault of their own. Brother Wolf has created a safe, nurturing environment where these special animals can heal emotionally and physically until they find a lifelong home. Their life-saving transport program brings dogs and puppies from overcrowded shelters in the south to rescues in the north where homes are easier to find. Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is a 501c3 organization. To learn more about their life-saving work and to make a donation, visit their website at www.bwar.org. That's www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-866-663-MYTV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. So, disable the cable and get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-866-663-MYTV right now to sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 in up to four rooms. And there's no equipment to buy. That includes your free HD TV upgrade, your free DVR upgrade, and your free professional installation. And the best part, the pristine digital picture and sound. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. So, what are you waiting for? Pull out 
about your major credit or debit card. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. 1-866-663-MYTV. Disable the cable, cut costs, and get more. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. 1-866-663-MYTV. On behalf of the people of America, we welcome you. Hi, this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America, this time the ScanSnap SV600. The ScanSnap group at Fujitsu continues to make the best performing end user scanners in the category, and their Vulture Stance SV600 looks a little bit like a banker's desk lamp, takes that in a whole new direction. It's an overhead scanner, not just a camera with a band of LED light that scans across a sheet, a book, or an object up to an inch plus thick, more or less nodding its head to feed the CCD optics. It's smart enough to keep working when you turn pages or flip sheets. Their software is intuitive, if a bit quirky, but happily, it all just works. Bottom line, the new ScanSnap SV600 stand scanner brings ScanSnap speed, quality, and convenience to whole new realms. This is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. It's uh, 30-ish minutes past the hour. That was uh, Marty Winston yet again. And uh, yeah, we're doing Computer and Technology News brought to you by Slimmer Utilities. And uh, Greg, were you done with that article, by the yep. way? from uh, mm -hmm. Qualcomm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Qualcomm. Yeah, I, I I've been meaning to uh, get them on the show because they make a lot of great stuff, and we haven't had them on the show before. So, uh, they're they're a big player. We talk about them all the time, and I thought it'd be fun to have them on. So, we're okay. working on that one. Okay. Okay. So, uh, da, da, how about for our next story, we can talk about uh, what virtual reality. Right. Apparently, at the, uh, the Global Developers Con Conference, there's been a lot of stuff coming out about virtual reality. It's where all of um, all of the gaming companies and industry has been uh, heading this year. Okay, all right. J just like last year, or the you know, last couple of years, it was all about the consoles and you know Steam, that kind of thing. This year, it's all about virtual reality and the virtual reality headsets. Right. So uh, apparently, this one from Max and PC, uh, Jimmy Thang, AMD announces Liquid VR um, uh, SDK, okay. uh, which is a source development kit, I think. Yeah. 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 So uh, providing presence inside a virtual reality headset or trying to make you feel like you are somewhere you aren't is a difficult challenge to solve. AMD is trying to help VR headset maker like Oculus VR and other head-mounted display. <laughs> By the way, they have a, uh, a new acronym for that now, yeah. HMD. <laughs> For anyone who's wondering, you know, instead of just saying those goggle things, uh, apparently they're calling them HMDs now. Yeah. Uh, manufacturers better solve that issue with its newly announced Liquid VR SDK. Uh, the big VR obstacle in the way of achieving presence pertains to latency. Minimizing motion to uh, photon latency, i.e. having the image properly update as you move your, your head around, is critical to achieving presence. It, it also helps you not throw up. Any, uh, yeah. Another challenge is that VR can be uh, extremely taxing on hardware. Because the VR has to render two separate images for both eyes, this essentially cuts your frame rate in half as your system has to render this, the scene twice. Mm -hmm. In addition, VR experiences demand a high resolution to avoid... Uh, yeah, that's right. To avoid screen door effects and a high frame rate refresh rate for user comfort. All this amounts to a ton of challenges, and with Liquid VR, AMD is aiming to help developers solve latency, comfort, and compatibility issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it kind of goes... Uh, Kind of goes a little bit in depth here, but we're just gonna kind of skip on down to AMD is calling. Uh, no, I'm sorry. AMD acknowledges VR has a tough road ahead, but thinks VR is the next frontier in computing and wants to accelerate the process. Uh, the company outlines several uses for VR headsets, uh, headsets which include education, medical, big data visualization, training and simulation, 
entertainment, gaming, virtual social world, and remote presence. Love the fact that entertainment and gaming are two separate things now. Mm -hmm. Love that. Mm -hmm. uh, the company is currently in talks with several, uh, with several HMD manufacturers at the moment, and time will tell if AMD's tools will help uh, will help and be adopted or will just be another cog in an ever-fragmenting world of VR. Because that's what we're actually seeing nowadays is everyone, especially with that, uh, with the cryptic message that was sent out by NVIDIA's uh, uh, CEO, everyone thinks that uh, NVIDIA, because AMD and NVIDIA, they're the two major uh, graphics card manufacturers out there, they think NVIDIA is going to come out with their own virtual reality headset. Mm. So between, let's see, so far we have uh, the Oculus Rift, we have Steam, we have AMD's new one, and then we're going to have uh, NVIDIA, and then that, and then there's probably like another 15 I haven't even mentioned. There's going to be a lot of different, oh, uh, PlayStation is coming out with one, that's right. There's going to be a lot of different uh, head-mounted displays out there. You think, is Logitech going to come out with one? I'm kind of wondering. I haven't heard anything. Logitech, see... This is where it's going to get confusing because if it's a peripheral, then most likely Logitech does a lot of things with with peripheral. Like their Logitech is never going to come out with a gaming console. Logitech is never going to come out with a fully built PC. Logitech is never going to come out with a uh, you know a a fully built tablet. They're all about peripherals and accessories, and they do them very well. So if the head-mounted display becomes an accessory, not you know, not its own set of hardware, then yep. they very well could. Yeah, all right. Maybe, but, should... hmm? Maybe I'll ask them. They may not tell me, but I'll ask them anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you can ask them. I bet you'll be mum about it if they are. But, uh, yeah, no, it, it's the head mount, and one of the best things about this article that they kind of spelled out was all the challenges facing head-mounted displays. And my favorite one, which they actually showed in a video that I watched, was minimizing the motion to photon latency, which is you know having having you know moving your head around and having the picture on the screen in your head mounted display actually track your head and move with you, because if there's any kind of, if there's any kind of latency there, it's kind of like having your eyeball stay still and you turning your head and your eyeball staying in the same place, like that's going to cause them like this. The largest sense of uh, vertigo you've ever experienced. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there can't be any lag there. And the other one is latency, where, like they, uh, the video I saw actually put a camera, like a head-mounted camera, on someone's head, and then they plugged the uh, the output into a head-mounted display, like the Oculus Rift. Yeah. And then they fed the image from the camera to the head-mounted display, and then they, you know, tried to like cook eggs, like make breakfast, where again there was no latency other than from the camera to the um, you know to the camera, mm -hmm. or uh, to, uh, from the camera to the head mount display, yep. try to make breakfast, and there was a latency of about three seconds. Okay. And to watch this guy make breakfast was hilarious because like he would crack the egg on the side of the skillet, put the egg in it, but because it um. Uh, yeah. But because what he thought he was doing and then what he was actually seeing was, was delayed, he was, like, missing the pan. He was throwing it on the floor by accident. He was going – like, there can't be any lag in there. It has to be as as quick and pos – it has to be as quick as natural motion is if these head-mounted displays are going to be uh, – are going to catch on. That can, Things like that can really mess you up. I mean, for example, uh, one that – I remember when I was just doing broadcast radio, but uh, – when you talk into a microphone and there's a lag between what you talk into the microphone and what you hear in your headset, even if it's like a half a second delay, oh yeah, it totally mess you up. You, you you can't talk. You literally will stop speaking because it's, it's uh, that that half a second delay is just you have to be. It has to be instantaneous. Now I know in your headset you actually don't hear what you're saying, right? You don't you don't see. Whereas mine, I'm I'm actually hearing myself. So, you hear yourself? I hear myself. That's how I know that if I'm on mute, I'm going to know it because I'm hearing myself, and all of a sudden everything goes silent. Oh, man, that's weird. I, no, I drive myself insane. No, because it's... Free night. I should be apologizing to all of you for having to listen to me. I couldn't imagine <laughs> listening to myself. That sounds awful. Yeah. No, actually, 
And and if you go into any professional broadcast studio, that's what you do. You hear yourself in your headsets. That's it. That's how it's supposed to well, work. Good to know that we just found another line between professional and what I do. So <laughs> that's good. Um, good. All right. But no, back back to head mounted displays and, via, and virtual reality. Virtual reality, the biggest issue they have before they go commercial. That's why we've been talking about these things for about a year now. Uh, maybe the Oculus Rift. We've been talking uh, about a year and a half now. They have to conquer that latency issue. There can't be any delay because if you, it, it, wherever you're sitting, whatever you're doing, you pick up your, you think about picking up your hand and then you actually do it. The thought to you actually pick up your hand is like nanoseconds. Like there's no delay whatsoever. Yeah. You think about it, it happens. Yeah. And if you try to do virtual reality and everything is on a half second delay, a third second delay, what have you, okay. it's gonna, it's just gonna rip you out of that uh, immersion. Yeah. So they really have to get the lowest possible latency, which is really, uh, which is you know one of the reasons why I'm so excited about uh, like that monitor we talked about last night with a one millisecond delay. That's the kind of that's the kind of precision you need when you talk about heads up displays right. or uh, uh, head mounted displays. There we go. Right. Okay. Well, Jonathan, by the way, in the chat room says his headset has that option of being able to monitor what you what, what you're saying in the earpieces of the headset. Uh, so I guess some, some headsets offer that and some don't, which I'm surprised because I thought all set all headsets had that ability. Are you saying every headset you've used with place that, with, with your Xbox? I feel like we've we, we've we've missed the point of the article here. Well, no, but I just I feel like we're going off on a tangent. Well, we are. We can, we're allowed to well, go. Well, let's go back to the article and then back to the tangent. Okay. Well, the the, the VR headset having the delay is exactly related to the audio. It's the same thing. I mean. When you when you have any kind of a lag between what it is you're doing, whether it be orally or visually, it's going to throw you off. That's my point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, okay. Um, are we finished with the story then? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Samsung, this is from CNET, loses smart, its smartphone crown to Apple. For those of you who are following these things, if it's a contest, uh, evidently according to the story, with its big screen iPhone 6 lineup, Apple jumped past Samsung to capture a 20.4% share of smartphone sales last quarter. This is according to Gartner. So basically, that that that's that's all. This is statistics, but it's the 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 interesting part of the story is that uh, Apple has surpassed. Uh, Samsung. They keep going back and forth and back and forth, and it's, this is just a numbers article. But I just thought it was an it was a, a interesting mention that right now Apple is in the lead. Simple as that. Uh, but I guess the 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 funny thing is that when you say a Android, like Samsung moves his smartphone crown to Apple. Apple as like a as like a cell phone manufacturer, sure, but as an operating system, Apple is like may still be number one because of that particular operating system because every Apple phone runs the same operating system, but Samsung, even Samsung phones, vary operating system from one to another. So the manufacturing rate for Samsung may have just lost to Apple, but Apple will, I think, will continue to, as long as Android is still so fractured, will continue to reign supreme in the operating system spec. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So okay. that that's it. That was that was just just a, a it's really just a mention. It's really even not a story, but uh, just that would mention it. Um, uh, I do want to uh, uh, now there is a, there is a, another interesting story that I'd like to do here. Um, uh, you know, there's a phone called the Black Phone Two. Uh, this is an ultra secure smart mo smartphone, uh, and there's an article. You know. They say, you know, there's nothing worse than getting hacked. Uh, they give some examples of, you know, of Sony who lost an estimated $100 million in malicious hacks. Craig, I feel like you're not getting into any of these stories. No, I am. Silent Circle is a company founded by Internet Security, a legend Phil Zimmerman. He did the PGB. Uh, P Phil uh, Zimmerman? I, lo I love that guy. Zimmerman, Zimmerman. And he wants to bring those types of hacks to a halt. The company solution, which is an end-to-end -end service that starts with an ultra-secure smartphone called the Black Phone 2. 
Now, the Black Phone 2 is an update to the original Black Phone, which was long heralded as an NSA-proof device before it was eventually discovered that no one can escape the NSA. Uh, the second generation of the device looks and feels a lot more high-end than the original version. There are still no aesthetic details on the phone, but the new version is slightly bigger and features a much better screen. It's now got a 5.5-inch screen, which is in the phablet territory, and displays full HD, which brings it up to the standards of most premium smartphones. Uh, the Black Phone runs on a modified version of Android called Private OS, which means that it is compatible with all Android apps. The company is able to secure calls, texts, and contacts using its own apps called Silent Phone, Silent Text, and Silent Contacts, respectively. No relationship to Silent Hill. That was a movie. Uh, the apps can be downloaded in the Google Play Store, and they're available to anyone with a standard Android for sending and receiving encrypted messages. Now, one of the new features on the Black Phone 2 is the ability to create different spaces, which are essentially different user profiles on the operating system. The phone is able to virtualize a new operating system with each new space, meaning that each account is completely isolated. It's as if you were running an entirely different phone when you switch between users. That's a very cool feature. Uh, although the standard version of Android can already create several logins, the virtualization that occurs on the Black Phone is much more secure and is unique to private OS. Along with its advertised security, the operating system is also incredibly easy for people to navigate and control. That's important. The security settings on the phone allow users to manage the type of information coming and going from every single app, breaking down data into categories such as context, location, and more. Huh. Now, if you if you if the phone is ever lost, don't fret; it can be remotely wiped. Well, okay, that's like a lot of phones. Uh, the Black Phone 2 is especially great for IT professionals to use because of Silent Circle's device management system. In essence, IT professionals can edit smartphone permissions, such as what apps you can download in bulk, which is nice. That means you can, you can control your whole organization with just you know with one IT guy at the helm. Uh, they also make it easy to distribute different permission sets using QR codes. That means IT pros can have employees set up their own phones by simply scanning a code. Now, to ensure that the Black Phone 2 will always remain safe, the company has a bounty program in place that will pay any hacker $128 for finding small bugs. You can get even more money if the vulnerability is more serious. Plus, the company promises to fix any critical security bug within a 72-hour window. But so far, all reported bugs have been fixed within a 48-hour window. The Black Phone costs four, $649 and is available right now. So if uh, you're looking for a real secure phone, this might be the way to go. Nothing is more secure than the color black. So, Or, or, or maybe two cans with a string. That's about it. Are you kidding? That can be totally intercepted. <laughs> you grab the string and you pull the cups. Ah, okay. Well, close. Okay, so uh, yeah, this uh, this is another article here from Max and PC from the Global Developers Conference. Like I said, there's a lot of news coming out from the Global Developers Conference. Yeah. Uh, wish we'd had that marked down on our calendars because it seems like they're announcing a lot of cool things, especially the gaming uh, community. One of them was an official company release of a Steam uh, of a Steam box or a Steam machine. Mm -hmm. okay. So the company uh, this is Cyber S Y B E R announces line of Steam machines at the Global Developers Conference. Uh, ever since Valve announced last year that it was delaying the launch of its Steam machines in order to perfect the controller, uh, we have been wondering when that would be. Last week, the company then announced that it would showcase new living room devices, a Steam VR hardware system, and a finalized version of the controller. And now we're starting to see the new hardware as Cyber has announced its line of Steam machines at the GDC. Uh, their Cyber, which was a division of Cyber Power PC, reveals that it will be offering six, count them six, Steam machines, 
Power by Steam OS with an in-home steaming, uh, steaming, uh, streaming <laughs> capability that will be available for purchase later this fall. See, that, steaming, the, that steaming capability will come in real handy if your machines are wrinkled. Just aside. Oh yeah, no, it's um, really does wonders on all that on all the electronics. Uh, uh, some of the some of the steam machines will be shown at the Global Developer Conference, and the company has provided some hardware specifications in addition to prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they have a quote here saying that we created the Cyber Steam machines to give gamers more power and more customization than the standard video game consoles like Sony, PlayStation, Nintendo, Wii, and the Xbox. Uh, at, the begin uh, at the cheaper end, end of the line, the company is offering a Cyber Steam Machine E, which will be powered by a quad-core AMD processor and an NVIDIA GeForce GTX graphics card with a retail price of $449, which is about, uh, I want to say that's about 50 bucks more than mm -hmm. the Xbox One. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And 50 bucks more than, no, uh, yeah, about 50 bucks more than the uh, PlayStation 4 okay. as well. Okay. The price what do you think? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm, yeah, 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 yeah no, the prices go up, but, uh, but, they're, but what do you think about their entry point being higher than any of the other uh, standard uh, consoles. But, but you're getting more of a you're getting basically a computer and not just a gaming console. Uh, this is this is this is the computer system. So I think you really need But to is that really worth it? Because let's say the specs are on par with all these traditional gaming consoles. Is it really worth the extra 50 bucks to be more customizable? Because in some ways, the limiting factor of the Xbox and the PlayStation 4 is one of the selling points of a console. Because you know that if you get any game for the Xbox One, it will run perfectly on your Xbox One. Yeah, but you, you, know, you can't live in fear. Because that's living in fear. You, you know, For 50 bucks more, you got a computer that you can run. With. You don't want to go out there and say, oh, I, I, I know that it's all going to be safe and I'm assured that it's going to run. You know, first of all, Steam is backed by you know a, a, a reputable, reputable company. They're going to support the system, and um, uh, I don't see uh, much happening. There. That's not living in fear. That's living in security. There's a yeah. difference. <laughs> no, I think it's living so. In... <laughs> yeah, so let's continue with the article. For a hundred bucks more, uh -huh. the uh, the Cyber Steam Machine P comes with uh, a little bit faster processor, a 3.2 Intel processor, and mm -hmm. an AMD Radeon R9 270X card. Mm -hmm. uh, and then those looking to spend even more money can shell out $1,000, which will get them the Cyber Steam Machine K, which has an Intel Core i5 and an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 970. That's a nice system. That's, That's a, nice, a nice system. That's a nice setup. Now, again, that was a Core i5, not the Core i7, which is you know the, the higher... Uh, the one that costs more money, but the Core i5 4690K mm -hmm. is almost top of the line Core i5 that you that you can get, yeah. and the G and the GeForce GTX 970 is almost top of the line. So that's for a thousand bucks, you're getting a powerful machine. So they also said that aside from the six models, the company went on to say that its Steam machines are capable of being fully customized with the latest hardware from Nvidia, AMD, and Intel, in addition to a new color being uh, available called Cyber Fire Orange. However, such steam machines will have a starting price point of $1399. Those, the ones that cost $1,399, uh, they'll probably be probably similar to traditional computers. It's just going to be in a smaller form factor because all of these steam boxes, like we keep saying, all these steam boxes, these uh, you know, these steam machines, they're computers. Like they really are computers. But they're in a form factor that is supposed to be similar and uh, comparable to an Xbox One or a PlayStation, or even a or or even a Wii, where you wouldn't mind having it, um, you know, on your on your console next to your TV in your living room. These are all meant to be living room, not uh, you know, not your office computers. But you could use it like your office. I mean, you're gonna have the keyboard. You could be doing all that stuff. It will be just as powerful, if not more powerful, than some of those. It, but like the point of this is, if you if form factor didn't matter to you at all, you could probably get these specs in a cheaper computer. Uh, you know, same specs, cheaper computer. If you didn't mind the form factor, 
where you're going to be spending the money is the operating system because that's going to be Steam, so it's automatically going to load into the Steam platform. And of course, there's going to be apps within you know the operating system to let you do web browsing and things like that. But uh, there's going to be the Steam VR, and it's going to be the form factor where it's going to look like a gaming console more than an actual computer. Um, you're right. Uh... They have actually uh, three different images of the, the Steam machines that they you can see some of the prototypes, um, uh, but it's a nice looking computer and again it's going to have computer functionality. So, uh, um, and you know for for anyone who wasn't paying attention, uh, the Steam machines they run like the the Steam OS, so it's going to boot directly into uh, Steam's big picture. So if you have already been invested in the Steam uh, platform, you know like if you're buying all your games on Steam, uh, if you're Playing all your games on Steam, this will port right over. You can uh, keep files on there, and, you know, keep it in the cloud, go you know, stream it to your uh, stream uh, videos and, and things like that to your Steam machine. And uh, it's supposed to be a competitor to uh, PlayStation and Xbox and the Wii, but it's also supposed to be something much more powerful because it's also supposed to be a computer on top of a console. Yeah, it's not supposed to be. It is a computer on top of the console. It well, it's it's supposed to work as a computer and a console, but it's primarily a console first. Like, if you're going to buy this, you're going to buy this because it's a console. Right. It, it's a console with computer capabilities, but you're buying this because it's a console. There are cheaper solutions and better solutions out there if you want a computer. Right. Does it come with a keyboard? Uh, it comes. It should come with a, with a keyboard, a wireless mouse, and a and a Steam uh, controller. And how many is, how many controllers can you have on a Steam machine? What, up to three. I think they said four. Four. Okay. Four or six. Four or six. Well, that and the Xbox One. How many controllers can you have on that? Four. Four. Three sixty was same way. But oh, yeah. but. But you kind of got to remember that the Steam OS is going to be a different uh, suite of games because right. anything that's available in the Steam, uh, you know, digital distribution uh, distribution platform, which ranges from everything from first-person shooters, real-time strategy, uh, you know, any kind of game. It's not just console games; it's any game available in the Steam platform you can then play on this computer. Okay. All right, that makes perfect sense. 90 seconds. Well, uh, I think we're just about out of time here. Again, we had some other stories that we didn't get to. Um, hopefully, maybe we'll get to them tomorrow. Um, uh, there was a story about the Steam Link. Valve announces Steam Link. We didn't get to that. Uh, a, a number of good stories. Also, a PlayStation 4 VR headset launching in the first half of 2016. Uh, some interesting stories. Maybe we'll get to those uh, tomorrow night. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, our guest from uh, MIT, uh, uh, the uh, 60 seconds. assistant professor of computer science, uh, Adam Chapala. Thanks for being with us here on the program. Tomorrow night, it's the first Wednesday of the month. That means it's Wednesday Madness, and Mike Cermak is going to be here, owner-operator of techguy.org. Uh, he will help us answer your questions about computers and technology. He'll have a quiz for us. He's always a fun guest. And he'll be joining us for the first hour of the Computer America Show. And then in hour two, you guessed it, we'll have computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. Hopefully all of you had a wonderful time. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And we will see you tomorrow night, same time, same station. So until tomorrow night, this is Craig Crossman hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you tomorrow. Seconds. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. All right, buddy. Thanks again. We'll see you tomorrow night with Mike Cermak. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.